is up team? In this video, I'm going to install an R1 Concepts six piston big brake kit on Benji's front end. I do have an unboxing video for it if you want to see what comes in the box. Now, if you don't know, Benji is the 1995 Impreza L with a bunch of 04 plus GD, WRX and STI parts. And I put the link up top so you can get up to speed. The knuckles I have are off of a 04 WRX, so this install would apply to that setup. After the install, I will show lap time results, weight and size comparisons, and discuss braking systems and choices in general. And as usual, there will be timestamps in the description for you to reference after you watch the entire video. So let's get to it. So before fully installing this kit, I strongly suggest you test fit it first. Test fitting in this case is partially installing the kit on one wheel and checking the clearances and fitments of all the parts. If I were installing a front and rear kit, I would test one on each axle. I consider a partial install because I'm not using thread locker and I'm not disconnecting or installing the brake lines. I am going to pay close attention to clearances between stationary and dynamic components like rotors and dust shields, and I'm definitely confirming my caliper to wheel clearance. The nice thing about R1 Concepts, the company, is that they send me a template to confirm the caliper to wheel clearance before I place the order. They emailed me the template and I printed it out and taped it onto a piece of cardboard. From there, you just check to see if the caliper part of the template contacts the wheel. So I knew beforehand that my street wheels would not fit without wheel spacers and my track wheels looked promising. The kit comes with shims in case you need to adjust the center of the caliper in relation to the rotor. These fit between the caliper bracket and the knuckle, so make sure your calipers are centered. With the wheels mounted, make sure you slowly rotate the wheel. What I found was the placement of my wheel weights would have caused interference with the caliper. The solution was just to place new wheel weights a little further on the outside of the wheel, and this was done during rebalancing. Had I not rotated the wheel during the test fitting, I could have really messed up my brand new wheels and brakes. So test fit the system and pay attention. Okay, so we're gonna jack the car up and rest it on reliable jack stands if you don't have a lift. Get your wheels off. Now you can take these kind of hard to reach bolts and remove the entire caliper assembly, or you can remove the caliper from the bracket and then the bracket from the knuckle. Once those are off, the disc can be removed. If it's stuck, you can find a bolt to fit into this hole and break it free by turning it inward. Or you can use a dead blow or regular hammer to jar it loose. Just don't miss and break something that you don't plan on replacing. And just like that, you can start the installation process. The first thing I'm gonna do is clean up my caliper bracket surfaces, threaded sections, and hub area. A wire brush and a little brake cleaner should do the job. It doesn't have to shine, you just don't want any dirt or grime to get in between your mounting surfaces. Next, R1 says to rinse off the rotors with soap and water, not brake cleaner. So guess what I did? I followed the instructions and cleaned them with soap and water. This cleans off the coatings and debris from the rotor manufacturing process. And just like I said in the unboxing video, this kit comes with pretty good instructions, but the one thing it does not tell you is the orientation of the caliper bracket when mounting to the knuckle. This is how it should be mounted. The brackets are symmetrical, so there is no left and right. You are going to use the shorter bolts that came with the kit. When bolting these in, you will use thread locker. All you need is a drop or two in the area that will rest in the threads, and as you torque them in, it will spread. Speaking of torque, these require a good amount of torque and must be set to spec. If you have a long torque wrench, you may need to turn the wheel because it can be a tight space. And please do not use an impact gun or just assume that it's tight enough. You do not want to gamble when it comes to safety components. In case you were wondering, I did install extended wheel studs but I'll save that for another video. Next, you're gonna put the rotors on. They are directional, so pay attention to the vein direction. Use a lug or two to hold the rotor in place while you install the rest of the kit. Now you're gonna place the caliper on top of the caliper bracket. These are also directional. They put a giant arrow that is supposed to face the forward direction. Take the long bolts and apply thread locker to each one and torque them to spec. These are easier to torque because of their position relative to the vehicle. And with that on, now things are looking pretty good and it's time to install the brake lines. So brake fluid can be pretty corrosive, especially to painted surfaces. 
Before removing the lines, lay down some shop towels or pig mats around the area. Have a spray bottle with plain water ready so you can clean anything that is spilled. You do not need a chemical cleaner. Now remove the soft lines that were fitted to the vehicle from the chassis side. Slide this clip out, loosen the fitting, and remove the old caliper and soft line from the area. Brake fluid will leak, and that is why I wait till everything else is in place to do this part. The kit comes with steel braid lines that are longer than OEM spec, so you have some wiggle room for fitment. To fix the line to the chassis, hold this end into the holder and tighten this end. There's no clip necessary. Then turn the chassis fitting into the new line. I routed my line around the strut to reduce potential kinking. Then I attach the banjo end of the caliper, making sure that I have copper washers on both sides of the fitting, and then torque the banjo bolt. The system should be sealed now. The lines are fitted with rubber grommets that fit into these mounts. I use the ABS sensor bolt to hold the line in place. This is very important because without having these mounts fixed, the line can work itself loose. OEM calipers usually have these nubs that hold the line in place, but these do not, so make sure you secure the line. Once the kit is completely installed, you can bleed or replace the brake fluid. Whenever I replace a hydraulic component, I replace the fluid. 8 ounces per caliper should do the trick. There's no benefit of being stingy with brake fluid because it's hygroscopic, meaning it absorbs moisture from the air. Moisture, air, and debris have a very negative impact on hydraulic systems. Traditional brake system flushes usually start at the caliper furthest away from the brake booster and you work your way closer. But vehicles with ABS and stability control systems may have different flush procedures and you may need to electronically perform them. So do your research how to bleed your system. Once the system is flushed, you should perform the bedding procedure. Bedding in is a process that mates the pads to the rotors and heat cycles all the materials. How you bend the brakes will determine things like bite and pedal feel. This is something that is overlooked frequently. Even stock brakes should be broken in when replaced. In short, you have to slow down then speed up several times at different speeds gradually heating up the materials. The best places to bed in high end performance brakes are the track, a long empty road, or a dyno because you hit high and low speeds frequently. Do not do this in traffic or residential areas. Once you finish your cycles, you have to let the brakes cool down completely before putting them to work. And the detailed procedure is in the instructions. Once the bedding procedure is complete, the install is complete. So now let's take a look at my lap times to see the difference. Okay, so I was able to take off two tenths consistently my first time lapping with this brake setup, which is very significant. My braking points were much later than before and I did not experience brake fade. For reference, near the end of their service life, the old set was good for about four hot laps and then the pedal would go to the floor. The new brakes feel the same as my old set on the street, but once you get these warmed up on the track, they feel better all around. I don't feel any issues with brake bias, but I think I need more seat time to determine if an adjustment is needed. Upgrades like brakes require seat time, reflection, and confidence to really get the most out of them. 
I also have not changed my driving habits from my bench lap time. And this is so I can show how the parts perform opposed to my driving. Once this series of testing is done, I will make some adjustments to my driving to see what kind of times I can pull out a Benji. There are also some suspension and aerodynamic adjustments that can be improved as well. So there is plenty of room for development and growth for me and the car. And FYI, I do not have ABS, so I cannot speak on that and how it reacts with the new system. One of the biggest drawbacks of increasing your brake size is the potential to add unsprung weight and rotating mass to your project. Here's a look at stock 04 WRX calipers, rotors, and pads. I have a set of brand new rotors and pads for this measurement. The total comes out to about 33.2 pounds. I did get my hands on some 07 WRX 4 pots with new pads, and measuring those with the stock rotors came out to about 29 pounds even. You lose 3 pounds just by eliminating the caliper bracket. Unfortunately, I do not have a new set of DBA 4000 series rotors to test, but my used rotors with new pads comes in to around 34.6 pounds, and they are definitely beefier than stock. And the R1 Big Brake Kit comes in at 32.8 pounds, which is 0.4 pounds or 6.5 ounces lighter than the stock setup, which is amazing considering the difference in size and performance. The weight savings come from the material. The OEM components are cast iron and the new parts are aluminum. There's an aluminum caliper, aluminum bracket, and aluminum top hat, and that offsets the heavier, larger rotor ring in this kit. There is room for variation considering that there may be some leftover brake fluid in the old caliper, but even if they were the same weight, the performance is far superior. Now it's time to talk about brake systems and brake component choices. The brake system's job is to convert kinetic energy into thermal or heat energy. So, the more heat you can generate and dissipate without failure, the better they will perform. With most brake components, heat dissipation can be improved by changing the size, material, and or design. A better performing brake system doesn't necessarily have to stop harder, but it should improve consistency during hard driving. When it comes to being a fast driver, the brake system and components you choose is very important. Your driving style, the genre of activity, and your ability to assess how you want the vehicle to behave are major factors in this equation. With rotors, bigger is better within the braking system, but too big can negatively affect the rest of the vehicle. The weight of the rotor can be reduced by changing the materials involved. Mine have aluminum hats, but some change the material of the rotor itself to a carbon-based material. And as you could probably imagine, there is a wide range in terms of use and cost. Finding that balance is really up to you. Now in terms of design, I think everyone agrees that slots help by refreshing the pad surface, which results in consistent bite and pedal feel. I prefer staggered short slots over long continuous slots for structural reasons, but to each their own. However, there is tension on whether having them drilled is beneficial or not. Drilled rotors allow particles to pass through the contact surface of the rotor to the center veins which bend out into the atmosphere. And this could be good to get rid of loose heated brake material and fluids, which would help dissipate heat. One of the reasons why people do not prefer them is because drill holes are prone to cracking. Without digging too much into material science, no matter how sharp or clean you drill or cut into something, you will create high energy points in that material in that area which will manifest itself in some sort of failure in high stress situations like high temperatures. However, many OEMs and aftermarket manufacturers still use and sell drilled rotors. Some say it's for aesthetics, some say it reduces the amount of brake dust on the face of the wheel. That's something that the individual manufacturer would have to answer, and I would love to speak to their engineers to hear their reasoning. So the next question is, Rye, why do you have drill rotors if you know they can be problematic? And my answer is because I felt like it. No, I'm just kidding. I live in a dry environment. I drive on a very clean road course. I am adamant on performing cooling down laps and I do not spray my rotors with cold water after taking a drive anymore. I also know that there is a tolerance for frequency and size of the cracks if cracking does occur. From my experience, severe cracking doesn't occur until the rotor is pretty beat anyway. These have like 8 track days and a couple of years of street driving with many 100 plus mile per hour hard braking cycles. 
So having drilled rotors doesn't really negatively affect my situation with Benji. I will say that if I were rallying or traveling to compete in places with varying surfaces and or precipitation, then I would not opt for drilled rotors. Driving off road can get all kinds of pebbles and sticks stuck in the drilled holes and the extreme temperature change from puddles of water can expedite the cracking exponentially. If you want to play it safe, I suggest getting quality slotted rotors. Now brake pad choice I think is less controversial in terms of design and more preference of compound. There is a difference between OEM, street performance, street competition, and race pads. These classifications are not superficial. The compounds are very different, which becomes really obvious with about five minutes of hard driving. With the exception of performance-based models, many OEM base pads will not hold up well in spirited driving, and things can get really dangerous quick on a mountain run. Street performance is good for somewhat aggressive driving and medium speed pulls, but aren't suitable for a track day in my opinion. Street competition compounds are great for non-wheel-to-wheel -wheel track days, autocross, and things like that. From my experience, with prolonged hard driving, they can be a little inconsistent. They probably won't fail, but you might have to lower your pace to cool them down every X amount of laps. Now, race pads are great for the track, but usually require a significant amount of heat to operate properly, and that may be sketchy for street use. Now, obviously, these are my generalizations. Every pad manufacturer has their own recipes and rating systems, and that's why I say it's preference because there is a wide range of products available and it usually takes some trial and error before you can find what you like, even if you stick with one manufacturer. If you plan on doing any kind of hard driving, I suggest starting with Dot 4. I've seen people overheat Dot 3 their first time at the track, maybe midway through the event. It's just not designed to withstand those temperatures. Most OEMs suggest flushing every two years or 30,000 miles, but if you drive hard, you should definitely monitor it and change it more frequently. Okay, in terms of lap times, I realize that it may be hard to reference what a decent lap time is on this track. So I took this beast out for a couple of laps. So stay tuned for that. Now I hope this video gave you some insight on installing the R1 six piston big brake kit and was helpful in general. There are plenty of topics, modifications and adjustments left to be done on Benji. I also have this bug eye shell in my garage, which has the potential to be big fun. I just have to source everything. <laughs> if you like to design, draw, film, make music, or would like to contribute to the channel in any way, please follow and contact me on Instagram and or Facebook. I can definitely use a hand in creating content. So subscribe, like, and share to become part of team Never Stop Learning. And with that being said, Stay tuned and thanks for watching.